What's up everybody D-Man back welcome to a brand new video and today we're going to be doing my trailer breakdown for Monarch Legacy of Monsters trailer 2 I cannot believe you missed 154 things in the Monarch Legacy of Monsters trailer too. Like, did you watch it? Did you see any of it? How did you miss all of it? That's on you, not me. The first thing you missed is the fact that there's only 153 things on this list. The, the 154 is just better for the Godzilla title. So there you go. Also, don't worry about how I count things. That's right. In this video, we're going to be doing my trailer breakdown for Monarch Legacy of Monsters trailer two. And I want to go right off the bat and just let you know, I have seen a few episodes of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Monsters. I quit watching the show when I found out trailer 2 was going to be out, but I am fortunate enough to have received an advanced screening of the season from Apple TV Plus, so big shout out to them. Thank you so much for that. So that does mean that I'm going to know a lot of what happens in this trailer because almost all of the footage from the first two trailers happens within the first five episodes of the show. So I just wanted to say that as a disclaimer. Sometimes I'm going to be sidestepping some things because I don't want to spoil stuff, but also just so you know, minor spoiler warning because I know what I'm talking about with a lot of this stuff. Starting out, there was a teaser for the trailer that plays before the trailer which is a stupid thing that trailers do but it does give us one shot that isn't in the main trailer itself. We get a shot of a young Lee Shaw played by Wyatt Russell in a military uniform walking beside a jeep. Now this is actually set in the show in 1952 in the Philippines and in real life it was shot in Hawaii. This is a very important realization here for Shaw as this is the first time he confronts the truth that monsters might very well exist. We then open the main trailer on the aftermath of San Francisco and this is most likely set on on G-Day plus three, which we do flash back to in this show. G-Day is what they refer to as the day Godzilla attacked the Mutos in San Francisco. The destruction of the city here is far worse than we realized in Godzilla 2014 and sets up pretty well for the overgrowth we see in Godzilla King of the Monsters. The destruction to the Golden Gate Bridge is much worse than when we last left it, and it could potentially be a result of the shockwave sent out by the nuclear bomb that went off in the Gulf of the Furlones. That was, of course, the one that Ford drove out to sea at the end of Godzilla 2014. Kate then tells us that Monarch was in San Francisco during the attack as we flash back to the Golden Gate chaos. We can see Godzilla gripping the suspension wire here and there is some truly amazing attention to detail in this scene. The placement of the tank near his arm, the fact that the east wire is already down because it was shot by a missile, and the fact that the buses are right in Godzilla's path of destruction. Little things here like the rain and the fog and the color grading are all wonderfully recreated in addition to that gorgeous Godzilla 2014 design. For those of you wondering, this sequence has been very heavily altered from how it was presented in 2014. Godzilla grabs the wire with the opposite hand here as this is not him investigating the bridge like that scene in the 2014 movie, but instead it's him crashing through it. Godzilla now takes much longer to break through the bridge, which leads to a very intense, horrific scene with some very Pacific Rim-esque shots. We see Kate escape the bus and begin to help children out of it shortly before a massive piece of rubble smashes into the bridge, sending the car and the bus teetering towards the edge of the bridge. This sequence reminds us of the horrors that Godzilla causes and much like with Andrew Russell, teaches us that there are true consequences to his actions, especially in 2014. The shot of Kate wandering the bridge in the heavy rain while Monarch workers walk around emotionless are really haunting. The Monarch outfits we see here are very similar to the ones we see worn in Godzilla vs. Kong. Monarch similarly brands everything, including their authentic 2014 camcorders with their insignia, much like how they do in King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong. We now see Monarch from a more disconnected and frightened POV here, as they seem unsympathetic and like some shady government or organization, rather than the altruistic lovers of the planet that we are used to seeing them presented as. From Monarch's perspective, this footage would be super important, as they need to document everything possible to continue research so that they can better understand and predict the Titans. This would also be footage necessary to prove to the government why they need funding. We also see Monarch soldiers here, showing that Monarch has included a military task force in their ranks following the 1973 expedition to Skull Island. This is an early form of what would eventually spin off into G-Team. We see Kate discover Randa's bag in a locker, and we'll get back to the room she's in later. This leads her and Kentaro to May, who asks if Kate believes her father was working for Monarch. If you look in the background, you can see May's computer flashing rapidly as they are unpacking Monarch documents. This is where all the close-ups of the Monarch files being cracked come from. As they dig into the files found in Randa's bag, Kentaro asks, who are they? What's Monarch? These scenes are set in 2015 and establish that Monarch is not yet a public organization. I believe that this series will deal with the trio teaming up with Lee Shaw in 
in order to expose Monarch to the public. I think they may actually pull that off in the season finale here, leading to the eventual public trials and protests we see in Godzilla King of the Monsters. While the text documents here don't really matter, it is fun to see the Monarch Eyes Only tag, which has been around since the opening of the 2014 film. We then flash back to 1952 to see a young Bill Randa and Keiko discovering a ship stranded in the middle of what looks like Skull Island. The reason this looks like Skull Island is because it sort of is. It was filmed in the same shooting location as some of the 2017 film, and also the shooting location of Skull Island in 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong. The ship here most likely wound up beached due to the actions of the Batmuto we see later in the trailer. Maybe it dragged the ship here? I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to spoil too much, but I will say this is not the first time we've seen this ship in the MonsterVerse. However, it does have a massive design change and has now undergone lore revisions. The aesthetic of the ship beached in the middle of the jungle is very Kong Skull Island and ties Bill Randa's past into his eventual fate. Randa is seen wearing a very similar camera to the one he eventually brings with him to Skull Island. In fact, it may even be the same camera. And I'll note that the camera here is in the 1930s style and was originally a reference to Carl Denham's character from 1933's King Kong. The next shot takes us to the aftermath of San Francisco. This is in the Salesforce Park area near Rincon Point, and we can see extensive damage to the shoreline, including the collapse of the Bay Bridge. Because this is set three days after the Battle of San Francisco, it's safe to say that the Bay Bridge collapsed during that little time gap because it was intact during Godzilla 2014. I'll also point out here because it annoys me, the Salesforce Tower is seen in the skyline. It's beautifully rendered, the CG looks great, it just shouldn't be here because the building was not built until 2018. This is just a few blocks away from where the male Muto obtains the nuke on the Embarcadero and is similarly close to where Godzilla makes his return to sea near Pier 7. If you look near the shoreline, you can see the relief camp that Kate is later seen in in this trailer. The filming of this relief camp happened in Canada and it's where Kate meets with her father and mother following the attack on San Francisco. An unidentified voice here says, this is the world we live in. Monsters are an inescapable reality and I believe this is a character named Verdugo speaking. She's not present in this trailer and I don't know much about her, but I'm theorizing that she could very well be the antagonist in this show. We then get a shot of Kate in Tokyo reacting to an alert on her phone as everyone around her starts to freak out. I don't want to give away too much, but this is the citizens of Tokyo receiving a Titan alert. We then see the Batmuto flying overhead. Again, I don't want to give too much away, but the creature is in the jungle and is stalking the grounds near the ship we saw earlier. We then see a bunch of military personnel searching through a dark, destroyed basement looking for Mei, Kentaro, and Kate. I think that these are probably Monarch members, and I have a feeling this comes during an escape sequence, as I think they're breaking Kentaro out of confinement here, as we'll talk about later. We flash back to the past to see someone lining up two different charts that happen to be tracking the same course as it moves in a winding pattern over the land. This is a very classic sci-fi thing, and it reminds me of the giant claw in the best of ways. I don't want to give too much away about what they're tracking here, but I will say it has to do with radiation. We then see Kate holding Randa's bag. This is her realization that he's connected to Monarch, as she can see the symbol next to his name, and is putting the pieces together to figure out what that means. It's then cut with this scene of Tim, a Monarch member, approaching Kate in the Tokyo subway, asking her where the files wound up. Now, I'm going to take a bit of a wild swing here. I believe Tim is truly a good guy. He has all of the qualities of our typical Monarch heroes, including the fact that nobody takes him seriously, and I think he's after the files because he truly believes that whatever Randa found could help prevent more G-Day type situations. Maybe it's got documents on sleeping titans, or titan locations, or maybe it's got evidence of Skull Island, or the Hollow Earth. Either way, I think Tim is on our side, and we just don't realize it. Also, shout out to Godzilla vs. Kong. I like seeing the logo here. It's nice to see them use the actual Godzilla vs. Kong font. We have this shot of Randa entering some destroyed underground facility, and this whole thing gives me big Chernobyl vibes, even though that's not what it is. And it is cut together very misleadingly. This is actually the nest we see Shaw, Rando, and Keiko exploring later in the trailer. It's cut with these horrific shots of Randa exploring some sort of wreckage covered in this organic slime. And while these seem to be the same location, they are very much not. As we see from these almost sinister-esque shots inside of Randa's camera, there is corrosion all around him and we land on what eventually appears to be a body encased to a wall. This is a very alien type sequence and it's clearly inspired by that film. We see Lee Shaw, played by Kurt Russell this time, in a rundown basement. I'm kind of theorizing that he has been imprisoned by Monarch earlier in this show and that he has now been released by some sort of good guy working within the organization that very well could be Tim. The computer behind him says primed and I think that this could either be some sort of like orca-esque signal that's primed meant to awaken a titan, maybe even Godzilla himself, or it could potentially be some sort of metaphorical nuke. It's primed, ready to go public with Monarch information, or it could be something 
anything else, I guess. The shot of the trio standing outside what appears to be a warehouse or factory is semi-misleading, because while Kate looks unhappy and almost disgusted here, and the trailer wants us to think this is very serious, I'll point out that the more telling reaction here is Kentaro. Watch the way he rolls his eyes, and that will give you a bit more of an indication about what the tone of that scene actually is. We find Lee shot in what looks like a retirement community where he seems to have become a botanist, but I will say the knife in his hand tells us that everything is not as it seems. Shah here is telling the gang that they can believe Monarch's lie about Hiroshi dying, or they can go find him. That is the actual plot of this series. The plot deals with Kate and Kentaro's father, Hiroshi, going missing. The government would have them believe that he died, but Shah believes he's still out there, and so they set off in search of him. The reason Shah's dialogue sounds choppy in this trailer is because they're actually covering up the fact that he says some cuss words here. We return to the office where Kate finds Randa's notebook and see her tearing down a map with sticky notes on it. This map is the same one Kentaro later investigates in the trailer and is reminiscent of Madison's conspiracy board tracking Godzilla in Godzilla vs. Kong. I believe that this map may reveal the location of potential titans or even monarch outposts. Shaw bursts through an old rusty door of a ship, flare in hand, and is then attacked by an enormous scaly hand. Flares are a reoccurring motif in the MonsterVerse originating in the 2014 Godzilla film, and the attack here feels very Cloverfield in terms of the confined quarters and human POV we see it from. This is the inside of the ship that the Batmuto is later seen attacking. The shot of Hiroshi in the desert feels very interesting. I think that this might be the reveal that he's still alive and has built some sort of gadget, and I think the gadget could be some sort of orca-type device meant to wake up Godzilla based on the fact we later see him bursting through the very same desert. I think that this could very well happen in the last episode of the show, and it could even lead to what is our final battle. This is Kate screaming for her father at the release camp from earlier, and this is set in G-Day Plus 3, three days after Godzilla's battle, and it's the last time Kate sees her father before he goes missing. Kentaro lines up these sheets of paper with this map to reveal some sort of series of markers on it, and I have a feeling that this is in one of Hiroshi's offices and is marking the locations he's heading to in this show. This is also reminiscent to the way that the two charts are lined up earlier in the trailer. There are a lot of past and present parallels within this series. We then see our past trio with the Geiger counter exploring what looks to be an old rundown nuclear power plant. A series of explosives go off, and these are actually seismic charges, much like the ones used on Skull Island. It's possible that the destruction seen to this facility was caused by an explosion, which could be traced back to a Titan. The burnt trees around the facility and the destruction here makes me think that this was caused by fires and massive shockwaves, rather than just a traditional Titan tearing through buildings. The nest and the eggs here feel very similar to the glowing Muto nest in 2014. The eggs here could be feeding on whatever radiation is left in this facility. Shaw steps in and accidentally opens a portal to a glowing underworld beneath them, almost as if they are standing on hell itself. This could be where the nuclear reactor is still burning underground and fueling the eggs, and it causes a tremor that eventually hatches the eggs, which reveal these armored bug-like critters that then attack the two. This cuts to a very similar portal to the underworld in the modern day. This is a massive Pacific Rim-looking rift that I believe is in Alaska. The helicopters flying around seem to be marked with the Monarch logo, and the green dots on the ground are most likely landing flares or signal flares, as I believe that this could be a landing site where maybe some helicopters touch down and it caused vibrations that open this rift, or maybe the helicopters wind up awaking something beneath the ice. The beam of light coming out of it is most likely ionizing radiation, which is seen in an earlier episode in the show depicted with a similar band of light in the sky. I think that this is probably the result of the big ice monster living underground that we see in this trailer. I don't think he's creating the lights, I just think he's in a radiation pit, basically. Shaw watches in awe from this helicopter, and I should note that this is not Kurt Russell's first time fighting a monster in an icy environment. He may be recognizing the radiation here as a young Shaw has witnessed previously in the show similar bands of radiation, but I do think that this is pretty bad for him and the rest of our cast as it seems that they are in Monarch helicopters, which I do believe means that they are being arrested by Monarch, who I don't think is on our side in this show. Shaw states, this world, it's not ours. Although that does sound quite choppy and it might not be his real line. That is very similar to lines uttered throughout the MonsterVerse so far though. Rando once said in Kong Skull Island, this planet doesn't belong to us. And Brooks reiterates that at the end of the film, stating, this world never belonged to us. It belonged to them. Reminding us of Rando, we jump back to 1973 and see him outrunning a mother freaking long legs on Skull Island. He runs through the bamboo forest straight to a rocky shoreline where the spider corners him. This is the same rocky area we see the mother long legs doing battle with the crab creature in the previous trailer. And in case you're wondering, this sequence does fit perfectly into the 2017 film and now adds further justification for why Rando winds up so worn out and sweaty after the mother long legs attack.
attack. Just for the sake of consistency, I'll point out how Rando's 2017 outfit and hat are a callback to Carl Denham from the 1933 King Kong. We see Tim in what looks like a cafe or an airport meeting with Kate and Kentaro, telling them it's so much more vast than we could possibly imagine, and I have a feeling he's talking about the Titan ecosystem. I suspect that following the Alaska stuff, Kentaro's probably taken prisoner, and in order to rescue him, they get help from Tim, who I'm thinking is going to be on their side and is probably meeting up with them post escape to debrief. Then, under the beauty of the northern lights, not unlike the aurora above Skull Island, we see an underground graboid style to chase as our characters fall under attack at what looks like a little camp they set up by a subterranean Muto. Underground kaiju are nothing new for monsters like this, with Megalon, Baragon, and Anguirus being previous examples of Toho kaiju that burrow. While the quality is a little crunchy in my trailer, I believe we're looking at Kate, Kentaro, and Shaw trying to escape the creature, and if that is the case, it seems to make sense because Shaw does have a close family connection to these two, and he kind of looks at them as if they're his own grandchildren. It seems that they're being chased and eventually split up by this enormous creature with this crazy mouth that erupts from the ground. This thing very much reminds me of the Graboids from Tremors, specifically the newer Tremors films, and I think it might be big enough to open the rift we saw earlier, so this very well may be where our characters need like a monarch rescue here, King of the Monsters style, the way that the Argo jet swings in to rescue our gang from Ghidorah. I also just gotta shout out the blue glowing tips on this thing's mouth, cause it looks great. We then see the inspiration for the NYCC poster with Shaw and Keiko hanging from these ropes as a legion of bug monsters attack. This is the same nuclear pit we saw them in earlier, obviously, forming a bug version of the World War Z zombie mountains in order to try and chase down and catch our characters. If you look closely here, you can see Shaw shooting a bug off Keiko, very similar to what happens in King Kong 2005. We then get this very classic setup here with the two characters reaching for each other, and again, if you look closely, you can actually see some of the bug creatures have started to climb up Keiko. The stuff with the soldiers walking and Kentaro screaming is probably after they get kidnapped, which I think happens in Alaska. I think they're getting imprisoned by Monarch here. It's possible all of the characters do, or maybe just some of them. We also have a promo image of Shaw sitting in what looks like an interrogation room with Tim and Duval watching over him. That's where some of the stuff in the first trailer is set, and I think that this potentially also happens after he gets arrested. As we do know, this plot basically deals with the characters going to Lee Shaw, who has information that Monarch is afraid of, and Monarch's trying to get him because of it. This leads into the shot of Kate and May in the underground facility as Kate says, these monsters and Monarch have taken everything from me, and another line that sounds choppy and probably taken out of context. At first, I thought this was part of their escape, but they aren't really dressed in the same outfits that we saw them in earlier at all. They are, however, standing in front of the Monarch spherical device that we see in the first trailer. This very well could be the same episode that we see the past plot where that device is used, because this show sometimes likes to add things from the past into the present, so that could be a good way to tie those two stories together. This leads into a series of shots of an earthquake happening in the desert, and we see a number of bodies tumbling down as we cut to this shot of Kentaro saving May from this truck flipping and smashing on its way down. And I believe, if you look closely, you can even see the dorsal plates of one god freaking Zilla in the background. Here it seems he is bursting up from the depths, as we will see later in the trailer. We then get these shots of an icy creature attacking a plane, and I think this might be a baby version of the creature we saw attack at night earlier in the trailer. If you look, it's causing this whirlwind with its mouth. This creature has a very Showa era styled ability, the ability to freeze things, including the man we see here, but it doesn't shoot freeze breath. In fact, it sucks the heat from the things around it. It's very neat. We then see more of the Batmuto attacking the ship, this time with Bill Randa inside. As I've noted in previous videos, the shot of it erupting through the ship here reveal it has horns, not unlike the winged titan with horns Baphomet. I think that this very well could be a young Baphomet who will grow up into a titan that Godzilla might fight in the end of the series. Also, I should note that the shot here of it bursting through the ship is slightly extended from how it was in the first trailer. Shaw screaming run in the cold is almost surely in response to the ice monster attacking the plane we saw earlier. We then see Shaw, Keiko, and Randa outrunning the tipping ship as the Batmuto attacks. The way that Shaw wears his camera around himself reminds me of Weaver from Kong Skull Island. Right then, Shaw tells us the world is on fire, and we see him in the Arctic surrounded by fire as the ice Muto approaches. Part of me thinks that this very well could be his death scene, but I'm not certain because I still have a feeling that Monarch is going to make some sort of triumphant entry to chase this monster off King of the Monsters style. But this shot does give Big the Thing vibes, which is why I feel it would be a very thematic death for Lee Shaw. I think we see Shaw most likely in the same room with the primed computer here telling Kate, if you want to save millions of lives, we could use some help. The trailer wants us to believe that he's talking about Godzilla, but I don't think so. I think he's actually trying to convince our trio that they need to team up with Monarch, 
who they have been trying to understand and afraid of this entire show. I think that this is kind of the reveal that not everybody working for Monarch is bad, as we see the Monarch computer behind him, indicating that this is a room of what looks like Monarch scientists who want to help. The final sequence in this trailer shows our characters surrounded by what I'm assuming are both land and air Monarch members, probably tracking them down as well as Hiroshi as the mountain range to their side starts to erupt. While Shaw and Kate are obvious in this shot, I'm not sure who the background characters are. I think it very well could be May on the left, Duval in the middle, and potentially Kentaro or Tim or a brand new character on screen right, I'm not sure. During this, we intercut with Castle Bravo, which also had an extended shot at the start of the trailer that we don't see here, where we see Godzilla swimming up in a very Godzilla vs. Kong styled shot that leads into this magnificent shot running up Godzilla's back that shows him rising out of the water. Godzilla looks absolutely amazing here. That being said, this shot has already become quite controversial, with some people defending it, while others seem to criticize the potential continuity errors it opens up. What I will say about this shot for now is that Godzilla's spines here are the 2014 spines, which give an indication of when this scene is set, and if people are right in theorizing that this happens when they think this happens, then that will determine how you feel about it. You'll either be okay with the changes made, or if those people are right, it may make you frustrated. The final reveal in this trailer here sees our gang standing in the desert covered in dust with a flipped jeep in the background looking up at what I believe is Godzilla making his strangest monsterverse appearance to date. This shot just kind of reveals that they survived the big mountain cascade from a second ago, and it ends with this shot of a wonderfully rendered Godzilla roaring in the daylight. It looks fantastic. Godzilla now has a new dorsal plate design that shows an in-between state between how he started and where they evolved to from 2014 to 2019. Godzilla's design overall looks most like his Godzilla vs. Kong design here, and it truly just blends the two Godzillas together. While many are comparing this scene to 1964, this is far from Godzilla's first subterranean appearance. Godzilla erupts from the ground iconically in Mothra vs. Godzilla, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, and Godzilla vs. Megagiras, while this shot most similarly parallels his reveal in Godzilla Planet of the Monsters. I strongly believe that this is in the final episode of the show and Godzilla will be doing his final battle here against either the Batmuto or maybe even Monarch themselves. Godzilla most likely has tunneled here from the Hollow Earth, and I'm assuming he's attracted to that device that Hiroshi has, and I absolutely love it. I've been thinking that Godzilla needs to do some more Hollow Earth tunneling since King of the Monsters, and I love to see it here. What do you think of the trailer for Monarch Legacy of Monsters? Were you hyped by this thing? I definitely am. I'm very excited to see what that whole desert thing is. I'm very curious to see what this whole tracking of Hiroshi leads to. There's a lot of great teases in this trailer that not even I have the answers to, and I love it. I love how vague this show is, and I love how little we know. Comment below and let me know what your thoughts and theories are. I cannot wait to hear them. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. Thank you very much for the support I get on the Patreon. It's through the support of the patrons that I can make videos like this for you guys. If you want to support the Patreon, you can use the link in the description below where you can get early access to content, access to the Discord community, and more. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you guys next time for the next one. D-Man out.